Thanks so much. We've uh, I've really enjoyed all the sessions I've been able to attend this week, uh, learned some new things, and really enjoyed the variety, um, everything from the students that we had right before us to some of the faculty the other days and the examples. So I uh, really appreciate being able to participate. And uh, Dylan and I just kind of wanted to have more of a casual conversation. We're going to start off with kind of the 30,000 foot view of how we think um, OER ties in with our other digital equity um, work that we're doing. Uh, this has been really the year where we've really shifted a lot of our focus when the pandemic hit. Uh, commission staff, we had, you know, holdbacks, we had to do a lot of adjustments. So we wanted to focus on how we could help keep how we could help libraries keep students learning and adults earning. And then, um, you know, we had the uh, a lot of focus on um, diversity and inclusion and equity and, and digital equity to me at least is one way that we can uh, focus some of our energy at work on addressing some of the, the big needs that we have statewide. So we're gonna talk, uh, share some definitions. We're kind of, I think at the beginning stages of really a ra raising awareness of when we talk about digital inclusion and digital equity, what do we mean? Um, sharing that with our, our board, public school librarians, really getting the word out about that. So it's a, it's a great time. And I, I really think that all the OER work fits in nicely with this. So, so we'll be um, sharing some definitions and then I really wanna open it up and hear from you, what made you kind of a, a, a passionate advocate for OER, how you think we can partner with the State Board of Ed to promote OER, um, get some projects going that, that we can support. So um, Dylan, should we just dive in with our next slide and kind of talk about what, when we talk about digital inclusion and digital equity, what does that mean? It's one too far. Thanks, Stephanie. Yeah, so this is the definition from the National Digital Inclusion Alliance that, that I've been using when I talk to groups of people about what is, what is digital inclusion, what is digital equity. And I really like these five areas um, because all libraries in the state are promoting digital equity and digital inclusion. Um, if, they, if they promote Lilly or they have a computer in their library that they're opened up to the public, then they're doing this already. But I think these five five areas, broadband devices, digital literacy training, uh, tech support, and then of course, uh, libraries have always focused on access to content and applications. So, um, but taking a look at how all these five areas complement each other and um, seeing where your strengths and weaknesses are and addressing some of those things are, are key to me. So I really loved uh, this, this definition from NDIA and and feel like it's helped uh, me focus a little bit of my um, energy. And even when we um, did a, a recent restructuring, uh, promoted Dylan up to the e-services supervisor and, and had that as a, a separate uh, division so we could focus more resources and attention on that area. This is These are the areas that really guide our discussion. Of course, OER fits in with our um, online content and applications and textbook affordability in there too. But I, um, if you're not familiar with NDIA, um, I think they have some great stuff starting with this, with this definition. Thanks, Stephanie. And uh, moving on, one of the other definitions we've been working with, um, in addition to these elements of digital inclusion, these kind of five elements, um, that's kind of the, the how, the pieces you need, but the, the why part of it or what you're eventually hoping to achieve is this digital equity, which is another definition we've, we've taken from NDIA. And digital equity, um, as they define it, is just a condition in which all individuals and communities have the information technology capacity needed for full participation in our society, democracy, and an economy. Digital equity is necessary for civic and cultural participation, employment, lifelong learning, and access to essential services. Um, so as you can see, that's I mean, that's a goal that fits right in with the OER plan, you know, lifelong learning, providing it, but um, you really need to hit all of those 
five areas for digital inclusion to reach this state of digital equity. So that's one of these things we've been wrapping our minds around too, is just, you know, sometimes the terms get used a little interchangeably, but they have a little different meaning in terms of inclusion as to how, what you need to do. And then hopefully you're getting towards a state of, of digital equity. Um, part of that reaching digital equity is, um, the need for digital literacy. And I think this also fits in with uh, what we were talking about with OER um, and digital assignments. Um, it's, it's certainly an area where we've seen, you know, throughout uh, in recent times, there's a lot of misinformation uh, and disinformation and uh, folks not being able to parse uh, how, to, how to navigate this, this landscape that we're living in for digital uh, information. So digital literacy, really the definition we're looking at here is, you know, the ability to use technologies to find, create, and communicate information requiring both cognitive and technical skills. So that's kind of a big ball of wax and something that I know all of you are very interested in, hopefully, and that libraries throughout the state are really working on helping people achieve that, not only just providing the broadband and the devices, but how do we get people to understand the digital content that's placed in front of them? And I think all those things um, with COVID and CARES money that, that came into the state helped address um, a lot of those needs and also helped highlight, you know, that people need um, all those skills to register so they can get their vaccinations so that so that faculty could effectively teach online so that students um, can receive that information and, and really highlighted um, inequities across the state, you know, between school districts, um, between communities, and, and had us all kind of take a look at how we could help address those. So this next part is kind of some of the things that we've done uh, statewide. Um, Idaho Business for Education did a survey with school districts right before the school year started and found that at least um, 200,000 Idaho students needed computers. Um, many students and, and teachers around the state um, didn't have access to Wi-Fi in their home. Um, how can we be part of those solutions and, and um, some of the things that we've done to address that? So Dylan, do you want to talk about some of our, our bigger initiatives that we've we've launched just this year? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, you know, um, some of this that has been done to address outside of uh, outside of necessarily uh, here at the commission, but you know, we've heard a lot of the CARES funds that have come to the state. Um, some of it's been distributed through the Strong Families and Strong Students Initiative, and there was uh, broadband grants. We'll get to that and how that was able to help us out and. Idahoans, and uh, also the uh, 100 million or so that was given to Idaho schools to get more computers and Wi-Fi into student homes. So there was a there was a lot of initiatives behind this that weren't just connected to us. But I'm going to speak a little bit to what we've been able to do at the commission um, to help um, bridge some of those gaps. We've really seen that we're always there, but the pandemic has really just amplified China's spotlight on for us. So. Um, Prior to moving into the C services role, I was the broadband consultant at the Commission for Libraries. And uh, one of those aspects, one of those tiers of providing digital inclusion is access to broadband. And um, one of the things we really are fortunate um, is to have access to the, there's a federal E-rate program for libraries and schools to participate in, to uh, have some of their, uh, their internet costs uh, covered. Um, and then we have a state program, uh, the Education Opportunity Resource for schools and libraries that covers the portion that E-Rate doesn't cover. So our public schools and libraries are able to um, have access where it's available in the state to really, really robust broadband that is covered through federal and state funds. And, and that's a way we've over the past several years have been addressing getting more broadband. We've seen speeds increasing throughout libraries throughout the state as fiber has been brought into some areas that didn't have it previously. And that's a nice trickle down effect as schools and libraries get it. It often trickles out to businesses and homes throughout the community as well. Um, we've also been addressing the aspect of needing devices. Um, libraries have been, you know, always providing public computers, but now we're looking, they're looking into things more that can be used outside the library when it may not be possible to come into the library, checking out devices like mobile hotspots, laptops, tablets. They've been able to use things like the, uh, um, 
CARES funds that we were able, some we were able to distribute in mini grants and some other opportunities that have been provided to purchase that kind of equipment to help people out who need it. Um, so that that's some of the initial uh, stuff we'd already been working on leading up to the pandemic and has also increased uh, throughout. Um, one thing I'm really excited about that we were able to do, I, I spoke a little bit about some of the CARES money went towards 50 million in broadband grants um, throughout the state. Um, we applied for and were awarded two $1 million grants um, back last summer uh, to provide um, upgraded Wi-Fi access. So as I said, we already had the ability to bring in better broadband to libraries, but that's only one piece. One part of the broadband is getting the broadband to the library. How do you get it out to the community? How do you get it out to the residents? Um, it's 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 got to help them by e expanding that access. So we received these two $1 million grants um, and 47 public libraries, because of these grants, were able to receive upgraded networking equipment um, that provides better Wi-Fi access both inside the library and with external Wi-Fi devices to folks that might be uh, coming through the parking lot, surrounding public areas near the library um, so that they have more access to Wi-Fi. As we noted, there were a lot of students that are lacking that. So that was a, a huge component. And this is all supported for a, a six-year agreement. Um, so it's going to last for years to come um, in providing this kind of access to, to the communities. So we're very excited about how we were able to do that and hopefully build upon that with some of the other initiatives coming up as well. Um, Stephanie, would do you like to talk about how some of our content or some of the talking book service has been able to address? Yeah, I think, um, and I'll add to with the Please. with the broadband and devices. I think Dylan and I did a presentation at an Idaho Library Association conference. Gosh, it must have been about three years ago now when it was in uh, Moscow. And as part of that, you know, li public libraries were um, starting to to buy mobile hotspots and uh, Wi-Fi things that people could check out and take home. And I called all the academic libraries in the state to see if they were also doing any, any of that. And I'm curious and hope you put in the chat if that's something that you've added as a service um, as a result of COVID and maybe been able to tap into some funds. At that time, there um, many said that they're they didn't think that there was much demand from students. So I'm just uh, would love to hear more about that because that's definitely an aspect of um, of digital equity. And then I think paying attention to assistive technology. Of course, we are we focus on the talking book uh, patrons in the state and doing things like having um, piloting some Braille refreshing devices and things like that. But I think um, we're paying attention to assistive technology as, as one aspect of digital literacy. And then um, we'll just, so I think that our, our digital literacy and the technical support is an area at the commission that we've, um, are tend to be a little bit weaker than our content areas for sure and Lily databases and things like that. So that's something that we're looking at uh, how can we develop that? How can we maybe provide some uh, credentials and some incentives for library staff to increase their own uh, digital literacy skills? I know that, that that's probably a challenge for, for everybody out there is how can we take it from here and, and move the needle so that all of us are more comfortable um, helping other people with those, uh, you know, all the different devices that are out there, all the different platforms. How can we be more um, digitally literate and be able to do that. But then another big project that we launched this year because more Idaho students had access to devices and broadband was being addressed, we really felt that there were some big gaps with content. So how many, there was only at that time, uh, 20 school districts that were providing access to eBooks through OverDrive. Um, I'm really excited since we launched this in November to see Gosh, Dylan, how many school districts are we up to as of today? Do you know? As of today, I, I last checked, we had 40 school districts that have been able to connect with us. Yeah. And for those of you that don't know, the um, particularly elementary school libraries in the state are terribly underfunded. Uh, 25%, you know, one in one in five, one in four, excuse me, my math today, uh, <laughs> have a budget of zero to a hundred dollars from their school district for, for books. So that doesn't, you can't buy eBooks, let alone, you know, hardcover books for students with a book budget like that. So trying to do, address those inequities by providing access to eBooks statewide, 
launched that in November and um, really pleased that we're, we're able to do that. In addition to the Lilly databases that kind of even the, the playing field for students across the state and also are available for our academic libraries. So that in a kind of a brief nutshell, anything else, Dylan, that you wanted to add about content and how we're addressing that um, there? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that that absolutely ties right in with yeah, all the, the OER stuff, providing access to content. Um, you know, one thing with this digital ebook alliance we launched um, that we were um, really kind of disappointed by is that we, we can't, Overdrive, Overdrive is not allowing us to include academic libraries in this. And that was something we really were bummed about. We were able to include school libraries and public libraries, but they based on the publishing models and stuff, they just wouldn't allow us to include academic libraries at this point. But that is certainly something we're still interested in is finding a way to um, connect academic libraries. I know some of you probably have some overdrive collections um, or other ebook collections and things that we can do to help you, um, I don't know, aggregate those, surface those, put makes make those powerful. That's what we're here for too. So yeah, content, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> And, and loved, would love to hear more of your ideas for that, but we really want to spend some time at this session getting your ideas. So we have a couple questions that we're posing. One was, uh, what made you an OER advocate? And we know that you wouldn't be here today if you uh, didn't have a certain amount of passion and and feel strongly about the need for, but what was it that kind of clicked with you? Um, Dylan and I can share what, what worked for us, but as we move forward with sharing um, this information with other stakeholders, how can we sort of spark that passion that may have uh, may have struck you. So uh, we were hoping people could just annotate on the, on the slide, but it looks like you'll need to put it in the chat or, or you use the question box too, because I'd love to hear what clicked for you and turned you into an OER advocate. And appreciate that Bob put in the um, chat too that BSU does check out some digital devices to faculty and students. So I'm seeing the level of student engagement and buy-in, realizing how freeing it was to my teaching and my students learning. I know um, if Kristen's still still in here, she spoke pretty passionately um, at the Moss meetup about um, how listening to the stats on student retention uh, really did it for her. You know that this is a we're all about student retention. Once we've got them there, how do we keep students going and and address textbook affordability? And I thought that was um, great. And it's widened since then. So feel free to expand on that while we're waiting for people to type in, I'll share. Um, for me, it was, I think, a session that I attended at, again at ILA uh, when it was in Moscow, the, the U of I um, library staff and faculty did a presentation on how they were using GitHub. And I mean, it was all pretty new to me, but they were so passionate about it um, and, and made me excited to learn more. And then I had a, a class um, where we watched Paywall, the movie, and I'll be, if anybody hasn't watched that, we had our development staff watch it um, just as a, a lunch and learn. And then I think we had one of the most interesting discussions that we've had as a, as a staff as a result of that. It was really engaging. And I think that we're going to have our board of commissioners watch it and then have a discussion. It's a really, I think, accessible way to um, explain the, a lot about academic publishing and some things that are super complicated um, in a more accessible way. So um, that, and then of course I have a, um, a student who's finishing her degree and every semester when she's, you know, trying to figure out her budget and how she can get things from Amazon or, or borrow them so that she can balance her, uh, her needs. Um, it, it drives it home too. It's super expensive. So um, Ryan wrote, just, oh, go ahead. I will just add, um, I know that you want this session to be a conversation um, I actually, I think I'm just going to go through and allow everyone to talk if you want to get on the mic. So, Great. Thank Great. you. 
So Ryan, if you want to um, talk on the mic about for you, what it's an accessibility issue, added freedom. Uh, we had a great discussion with the with the library staff at CWI and Ryan really talked about how framing OER as a textbook affordability, um, that was how they've been able to get more of their faculty to uh, open to discussions. And we certainly have been doing, trying to do more of that at the commission too. And then um, Dylan, why don't we just go ahead and throw the other question on there too, and people can open up with their microphones and, and either talk about what made them an advocate or, or if you have ideas for how um, the Commission for Libraries can better support OER and textbook affordability efforts. I uh, really like the session that we had from uh, the faculty at LCSC who were talking about um, loaning books and graphic novels and things like that. So I don't wanna just limit it to that, um, but I will stop talking for a minute and just let you chime in with your ideas for partnering and doing that. So I usually take up a lot of space in these conversations, but I do have some ideas, but I definitely want to invite others to comment. And I don't know if you saw Ryan's comment uh, in the chat. He says, for me, it's a combination of accessibility, the added freedom for instructors to adapt materials for the actual students at their institution and added diversity and inclusivity potential. But um, I noticed that your question, uh, Stephanie, is really specific to textbook affordability efforts because I know this conference is about higher ed and you know, uh, textbook affordability has been the issue of the day. Um, I don't know that I have like great ideas for that because I kind of thought with all the conversations you've been having about digital equity that maybe you were interested in OER for the general public or people who are trying to access information through public libraries. And I would just wonder if ICFL might consider coordinating some sort of effort to get existing OER into their library catalogs. That's a great idea, Kristen. Um, I definitely think that that we would be interested in that and using either the Lily, you know, platform that people might already be familiar with and um, adding more information there and making it accessible. Um, so excellent idea there for the general public and as well as students. Ideas for maybe um, promoting awareness statewide. I think that that's um, something that's definitely needed along with the sort of the definitions of uh, digital inclusion and digital equity. There, I think there's a lot of people, including um, some of our library community members who don't know what OER means, what it really means to the profession, um, how they can all be advocates for that and um, kind of spreading the word. And then I was really interested, um, Jonathan's opening remarks about how OER can inspire collaboration and that a lot of this movement is about building relationships. Are there some additional ways that we can um, foster that and, and encourage cross institution, uh, maybe academic and secondary library folks working together. So I'd love to hear um, more of your thoughts on that area as well. I think that's really interesting, Stephanie. And I, I kind of wonder if a role of ICFL couldn't be pinpointing pain points for maybe K through 12 or maybe university libraries where OER doesn't exist and then perhaps advocate for advocate for money or just try to promote those connections, right? Like you were saying, like who's interested in collaborating on a project to address that issue? That's a great idea. So not only identifying pain points, but maybe also some of those best practices and the just the stories that we've heard the last few days about successes and the Opal fellowships and um, yeah, I think I think that's great. Well, I like suppose that if you're your I know one of your big goals is information literacy. Suppose you develop a module for K through 12 folks and you bring in the expertise on that from interesting interested parties or just thinking out loud. No, I think that's great. 
And Jonathan says, great point, Kristen, the gaze of ICFL is broader than any of the other agencies or institutions in this conversation. And I would really agree with that. When you get up to this like very broad level, like the State Board of Education or the ICFL, making connections can be a really strong um, uh, uh, strength, a strong strength <laughs> of those institutions. <laughs> Yeah, and we have a nice history of working with the State Board of Ed, and um, so I think uh, exploring some other ways here, and, and we've certainly, I think, dipped our toes um, into that through the um, ICFL staff participating in the OPAL Fellowship, and they're going to be talking about that tomorrow and, and looking forward to that session, too, um, and, and making sure that we try to, to bring it up at our Futures Conference, at the, the Moss Meetup last year, and, um, and talk about some of those things, but, but I think there's a lot more that, that we could do, and I think we're ready to, to dive into that, so other ideas that people have, and I, I know we're about at time, so um, you can, if we don't get to it today and you think of things, um, you can email Dylan or myself anytime. Uh, we love to hear from the library community. I think it's, it's, you guys have great ideas and that's what we're all about. So please do reach out anytime. Um, and we take all those suggestions and ideas really seriously. And, and this is a good time as we're planning budgets for next year and kind of looking at um, what we're going to be doing in the next fiscal year to consider some, some out of the box thinking. So Thank you for inviting us to speak today. And again, have really enjoyed uh, the sessions that I've attended and, and love this topic. Yeah, what a great group. Thanks so much. It's been great to be here and just get to share this with you and hear everybody's ideas. <laughs>